Hello everyone, my name is Victor Wotschu and I'm a senior research associate at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers. Um, for the last few years I've been working on the Eurocom project and in Amsterdam we were responsible for um, modeling disease progression in multiple sclerosis. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about um, applications of the event-based model in MS. So MS is a demyelinating neuroinflammatory disease that uh, leads to lesions that can be seen in MRI scans. So what does this mean? On the left-hand side of this figure, we see a healthy nerve fiber. Um, and healthy nerve fibers are surrounded by these uh, Schwann cells which consist of myelin and uh, these myelin sheaths um, insulate the nerve fiber and this helps with uh, signal propagation. In a nerve affected by MS on the other hand this myelin gets damaged and the fiber is somewhat exposed and this uh, hinders signal uh, propagation. And depending on the uh, location and the extent of this damage, this can lead to cognitive decline or physical disability or both. Uh, on top of that, there's a strong uh, neurodegenerative component in MS. Um, so there's atrophy. And um, overall, MS is one of the major causes of disability in young adults. Um, since I'm going to talk about uh, EBM type of models, just a quick uh, recap. Uh, even though Neil just gave a very nice introduction on this in the morning. Um, the goal is to model temporal orderings of events from cross-sectional data, and event means um, a biomarker becoming abnormal. So what we do is to look at our um, biomarker distributions and try to define um, what's normal and what's abnormal. And um, in this case, we use a Gaussian mixture model to derive an abnormal component, so events that have happened already, and a normal component, events that are yet to happen. Um, once we have that, we basically just need to throw it all together. The probabilities from all subjects and all biomarkers are put into a statistical model, um, and we then use a greedy approach to obtain the most probable ordering. Um, and as a final step, we uh, use cross-validation to estimate the uncertainty. Um, today I'm going to um, present three different uh, studies using um, EBM type of models. Um, the first one is on atrophy. The second one um, on more general disease progression using uh, multimodal biomarkers. And uh, finally, a study on uh, data-driven subtyping of MS patients. Um, this um, figure basically summarizes the work of a former colleague of mine, Arman Eshavi from uh, UCL. He used a data set consisting of a bit over 3,600 uh, patients and extracted um, regional volumes from their MRI scans. Um, regressed out the confounding variables, transformed everything to z-scores, and uh, then ran the um, Gaussian mixture model to derive the uh, normal and abnormal components, as I just uh, explained. He then used um, the greedy, uh, a greedy SN search to find the um, sequence with the highest likelihood and uh, finally performed a cross-validation to get an esti um, uncertainty estimation. Um, this are uh, his um, main results. He found um, two different um, orderings of atrophy progression for two different types of MS. The first one is relapse onset MS, which is characterized by uh, phases of relapses and phases of uh, remission. And the second type is the primary progressive MS type, which is characterized by continuous worsening of the um, patient status um, without explicit relapses. Um, on the y-axis, we have the um, most likely ordering of um, brain regions becoming atrophic. However, um, I think you would agree that this is rather hard to um, interpret and compare, but fortunately we can also project this onto um, 
brain scans. And then it becomes much more easier um, to compare the two different uh, progression patterns. And uh, we can see, for example, that the relapse onset um, has an early event in the cerebellum um, and also relatively early deep gray matter involvement, which um, we can't see in the primary progressive type. But um, the more um, we progress towards the late stages, the more similar the disease progression patterns actually become in the end. So to conclude this part, um, the model um, is very nice and provides insightful uh, findings. We can see that there's a generally similar progression pattern between different types of MS, but there are also some differences in key regions. For example, as I mentioned, the um, earlier involvement of the deep gray matter and cerebellar regions in the relapse onset MS type. Um, however, um, MS is more than just neurodegeneration. Um, and with this, we come to the second part, um, disease progression using multimodal biomarkers. And um, one of um, the motivation for this is um, essentially that MS really is not just neurodegeneration, um, but also that many studies, especially clinical studies, look only at individual biomarkers at a time. And this makes it um, very difficult to put um, findings into context and assess interaction and uh, time between those biomarker um, events. So what we did is to derive data from 391 subjects, and about 300 of those were uh, MS patients. Um, and we derived 28 biomarkers. Um, 11 were regional brain volumes, so to some extent we replicated the atrophy work, um, but we also included um, measures of um, neuroinflammation. We uh, included four fractional anisotropy uh, features, which are DTI measures of microstructural change. Um, we included three centrality measures, which are um, network measures of functional change. And finally, um, the results from neuropsychological assessments. So we have information about um, seven cognitive domains. And using this data, we created three models. The first one is on the general MS progression. So going from healthy controls to MS. And um, two additional models for um, patients that already have MS but progressed from a low disability score to a high disability score, um, or um, similarly from a cognitively preserved state to a cognitively impaired state. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to show uh, the results for the general MS progression model. This is what our positional uh, variance diagram looks like. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, more than we saw in the previous plots. Um, however, this is um, somewhat expected. I will uh, go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but despite the uncertainty, we can actually still derive some useful information. For example, we can tell that the um, corticospinal tract is um, definitely a rather early event especially if we compare it to the other um, DTI measures, which are all the way down here. Um, similarly, we can see that the cerebellar and uh, thalamic volume uh, appear very early, which is perfectly in line with uh, the findings that um, we saw in the previous study. And we can also see that there are certain cognitive domains that are affected early in the disease course, whereas others um, are really um, only being affected at the end of um, the disease progression course. Um, this uh, sequence, of course, can also be used to stage subjects. And if we do that, we can see that the um, majority, about 70% of uh, healthy controls, are staged in um, stage 0, 1, and 2. So they have absolutely no abnormality um, or um, only two biomarkers um, abnormal yet. And we can also see that um, there's 
no healthy controls staged higher than stage 11. Um, in comparison, the MS patients are uh, much more spread out across um, all 21 stages. Um, and this is um, quite expected because MS is a very heterogeneous disease. Um, so we will have uh, some patients that might have a very mild form or maybe just a very short disease duration, um, which are also no biomarkers abnormal yet. But um, there's also a full-blown uh, multiple sclerosis course um, where patients essentially have all biomarkers abnormal already. Um, so to conclude, there's a lot of uncertainty in the model and um, there are several potential reasons for that. One is um, simply biomarker correlation. Um, if we measure similar things in similar areas using similar tools, then these um, measures will automatically be somewhat correlated. Um, for example, if you uh, yeah, look at different cognitive measures, they all kind of collect similar information, so there is always some correlation. Um, another reason for the uncertainty is simply that it's a very heterogeneous disease course, so patients do not all follow the same uh, disease trajectory. Um, and this is also something we can see in biomarks like the singlet volume, where you kind of have a distinct um, cluster of patients that have it as an early event and another cluster that has it as a late event. Um, and this kind of suggests that there might be several subtypes of um, um, several clusters of patients in there that um, follow different disease trajectories and we're just trying to force them all onto one single um, common sequence. Um, however, Overall, we uh, can see a rather sensible ordering. It's in line with previous work, both with the um, atrophy work I just showed, uh, showed but also with uh, more clinical research on individual biomarkers. And um, yeah, the big question is now, can we actually detect distinct subtypes um, in our um, MS patients that do not um, are forced on one single trajectory? Um, and to do this, um, there is an uh, advanced model, an extension of the EBM that was um, developed by Alexandra Young, uh, who will present a poster um, on her own work um, tomorrow afternoon, I believe. Um, and this um, extended model is called subtype and stage inference, and um, it aims to simultaneously model disease sequences and identify clusters of patients that um, share a trajectory. So the big advantage here is it does not force all patients into one common trajectory. Um, the work I'm showing now, again, is by uh, Arman Esagi, a former colleague of mine from UCL. And um, he hypothesized that there are subgroup of patients that share patterns of disease progression in terms of brain, uh, brain imaging measures. Um, he used data from uh, over 8,500 MS patients from 17 clinical trials. And from this uh, data, he derived three types of features. The first one was uh, regional brain volumes, so go back to atrophy. The second one is uh, lesion loads, um, these ones. And the third one is um, a measure of normal appearing white matter, that is essentially um, all the white matter um, in the brain that is not affected by lesions. And he mapped this by dividing the T1 MRI scan by the uh, T2 MRI scan and used the um, ratio of this um, as a feature. So using this information, he extracted three um, major subtypes, or he identified three major subtypes. The first one is um, cortical MS subtype, where the um, occipital lobe becomes abnormal first, together with, um, oh, sorry, um, and lesions are affected relatively late, and the um, atrophy then progresses through the 
cortex and certainly, yeah, as I said, lesions come rather late. And the second subtype is the normal appearing white matter type where um, white matter is uh, affected early. Um, and then you have um, frontal atrophy and, um, sorry, Um, yeah, then you have frontal atrophy and uh, then it progresses to the deep brain matter and to lesions. And uh, finally, we have the classical MS subtype, which um, has early uh, involvement of lesions and um, deep brain matter, which is really um, what MS is classically known for. Um, if we look at um, basic clinical and demographic information, so in this case, disease duration, age, and uh, EBSS, which is the main disability score, um, there are no clear trends between these groups. There are no clear differences. The age actually looks very, very similar. Disease duration as well. They are mostly all um, at a rather early stage in the disease with a very high peak at about you know, five years. Um, the classical MS type has a slightly less pronounced uh, um, peak at the beginning, so it has more patients with a longer disease duration, and as a result of that, there's also a slightly more pronounced peak of the um, higher disability scores, but still um, there are very, very small differences in terms of uh, clinical and demographic information. Um, if we look at advanced clinical information, it's a, a slightly different story. So for example, the relapse rate is uh, lowest in the cortical subtype and highest in the um, classical MS subtype. And in the treatment response, it's quite the opposite. So the cortical MS subtype um, um, responds very well to treatment and the classical MS subtype does not very well respond to treatment. So to conclude, um, there were three subtypes of MS identified in a purely data-driven fashion using the SUSTAIN model. Um, classical MS shows the worst outcome, while uh, the others are more responsive to treatment, for example. And this could potentially be used, for example, for um, better stratification of patients in clinical trials. So to conclude my um, talk overall, um, EBM and SUSTAIN are both uh, very interesting um, for disease modeling in uh, multiple sclerosis. They are very useful tools um, that can be almost directly applied in clinics for patient monitoring, in um, drug development uh, for patient stratification in clinical trials but um, also in more basic research to help with the interpretation of studies that look at uh, single biomarkers and want to um, put them into more context. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and of course, I'm available for any questions. Thank you.